So, uh, okay. All right, so, so uh, there are a couple of points here uh, that uh, I want to reiterate. Uh, first of all, there is a quiz today on, on digital art, so don't want to forget to take that. That's about uh, uh, roughly 20 questions. Uh, well, many uh, national columns and uh, uh, The attendance, I have not updated that yet. Okay? I didn't have time to work on it yesterday. I will be working on it today and yesterday is great. And hopefully it will be uploaded later. And then uh, also the podcast I have put up there from yesterday or I think the day before yesterday. Because it certainly takes one time. Yesterday was not safe. Uh, about yesterday, funny thing, uh, we had to stop and see this movie about uh, uh, horseshoe bread. And so that first few slides of recording is gone, and so we have to start recording after that. So next time, we need to save the file twice as we go through movies if we get all the movies together. No more movies. All right. So those are the points I wanted to make before we start. All right. Uh, any other way? Questions, concerns, other than what I mentioned? Okay. Cool, cool. I think we're doing good with the course as far as covering material. Uh, and and I, think, I think we'll be fine. Uh, now, I forgot to mention this table when I talked about human global. It was part of the lecture that we didn't get to the day before yesterday. I skipped through it. And it's basically another kind of way to review stuff. And I just want to touch on it again. I had a particular question about the uh, human body, just because it's such a fun program. And so here, uh, we have the, 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 basically, there are many take home considered the cost of human body as, as we call these fantastic proteins. So, uh, one of the main things is that we have two conformations, uh, uh, tense and relaxed. Okay? Tense is the one that does not buy an oxygen, so I'll go through this. All right? Uh, and, and tense has more more hydrogen and, and ionic bonds, more weak bonds are in the tense conformation than, than the relaxed conformation. So that's number one. That's why when we talk about those, those different factors, those different pairs, they actually all work on adding more weak bonds, and hence they more. Okay. The other thing about tense, of course, it does not bind oxygen, and hence it releases oxygen. It's, it's not any oxygen binder, it releases oxygen. Uh, the exact opposite of the relaxed, less hydrogen bonds and ionic bonds, and of course it binds oxygen very, very efficiently. Okay? So those are the two differences. What other differences are there? Low oxygen pressure, when there's not much oxygen, hemoglobin would tend to tense up. Then there's no oxygen to bind. So obviously it will be tense. And of course if we have low pH, also be tense, that's one of the factors. That's the Bohr effect, if there's less uh, uh, if the pH is lower, and of course, if there is a high carbon dioxide. High carbon dioxide uh, is one of the factors that will tense the uh, hemoglobin and it will basically force it to deliver the oxygen. Because, it, you know, let's, let's, let's think about it logically. If you are having a lot of carbon dioxide from the cell because it's respiring, it probably needs oxygen. It's active metabolism. So, that, uh, it's logical for hemoglobin to deliver oxygen to this cell or to this environment, let's say. Okay? The exact opposite, of course, in the relaxed. High oxygen pressure, especially around the lung, where the oxygen is 100, 100 torrs or 100%. Uh, high pH, you know, uh, is usually uh, relaxing for the uh, hemoglobin, and low carbon dioxide. By the way, carbon dioxide is carried by, by hemoglobin. But most of the carbon dioxide is carried through the blood by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. The enzyme itself doesn't carry carbon dioxide, but converts it to carbonate. And carbonate is one of the ions that fill the blood, and that's one of the things we. So, so, so there are two modes for carbon dioxide to be released. Okay. What other players are there? 2 3 DPG. And that we can explore later when we talk about metabolism. Cells that are actively uh, metabolizing, metabolizing stuff, they will produce uh, these metabolites. One of them is 2,3 uh, this phosphoglycerate, or 2,3 diphosphoglycerate. Here we have to worry about the structure. 
but that is also an indicator like carbon dioxide, there's a lot of metallic going on, and of course that binds to an allosteric site, and hence it will tends up the, uh, the uh, hemoglobin. Usually there is, there is a site and two beta strands are involved in the histogen. All right. Okay, that's a member of the hemoglobin molecule. Of course, that site, that allosteric site, doesn't even exist if the hemoglobin is relaxed. Okay? So that's the table that I didn't get to talk about, and I, I, uh, I'm just mentioning it as another way to look at hemoglobin. Tense, relaxed, and then just go through these factors that make it new. Okay. So let's have our first question. What is the composition of the field hemoglobin? How about that? Field hemoglobin. So let me open that. All right. Okay. Back to chapter 11. Uh, so we started talking about carbohydrates. So we mentioned that we are extremely personal molecules. And today we are actually going to have some taste of that because the versatility is amazing. As a matter of fact, far more than, than uh, peptides and amino acids and uh, far more than lipids because they have so many subtleties in their binding pattern that would give totally different molecules to totally different properties. And we'll see some of that today. Of course, we mentioned how important they are. Every molecule of study is important, obviously, because it's part of one or another process that are vital for life. Uh, like nucleotides, cell walls, uh, uh, toxins, well, well, uh, and the names. Now, we did uh, categorize carbohydrates into aldehydes and ketones, right? And we've seen the difference between them. Uh, and so we called those aldoses and ketoses. And we said there are, they can range from three all the way up to nine. We will see up to seven this, this semester. We also talked about the D configuration being the main configuration that we are concerned with in this course. And we have seen what it means. It means the carbon uh, before the last one, the OH is always, always to the right. Yeah? And then we talked about aldoses, or we need to memorize in those aldoses. Those are monosaccharides. Those are one unit of food. Right? Aldoses, those are the ones that will be uh, repeated over the semester, that's why we need to know them. And of course, the ketoses, right? Now, at that point, we introduced an epimer, the, the, uh, uh, the concept of epimer, which is basically one uh, chiral carbon between two monosaccharides that's different, all right? And we said, or at least I suggested, uh, that it would be maybe one way to memorize them. And the, the thing that's easy about carbohydrates, at least the ones that we are concerned with this, this semester, is that, again, in case of aldoses, aldoses and in case of the open chain aldoses, that the, there are three carbon atoms that are very easy to memorize. These are always constant in all of them, which is the first one that has the aldehyde, and then the last two which is the one that is always in the D configuration, and the last one, which is CD, actually, right? While in the ketosis, four of the carbons are taken care of, uh, taken care of for you. And that's, of course, the first two, because it's a ketone, and then the last two, which is the D configuration, and the last carbon. And so, whatever is in between, that's all that really is meant to be memorized. And then, of course, the fact that they are epimers. So if we memorize glucose, we know that mannose is epimer at carbon number two, and galactose is epimer at number four. That's it. And so on and so forth. Yeah? So if you just have, so they're very simple to memorize. All right? So glucose, see? Glucose is down. Galactose, which is epimer at carbon number four, that's one, two, three, four. Okay? And hence, it's up, right? So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is alpha down, beta up, right here, alpha down, and beta up. So that's the difference between that and the Then, okay? any question about this? So it is a galactose, and it is alpha galactose. Yeah, it's not beta galactose. Okay? 
So this is the type of structural questions that you would expect in the quizzes and the papers and the exams. And I need to be very vigilant about this. That's the only trick actually in trouble. It's not it's not that bad once you have those rules somehow written. Okay? Um, all right. Ah, hexoketosis. I just talked about that actually. Hexoketosis tend to form five membrane structures derived from which one of those mother molecules? Which one of those molecules? Yes, yes, absolutely, it's free running, absolutely. Okay, the hexoaldoses are pyrans. Right. Okay, now let's delve a little bit deeper into the world of carbohydrates, the fascinating world of carbohydrates. Okay? We are going to talk now about how versatile and how diverse those molecules, just because of a single, single chemical event, just a single chemical event on the molecule will give you totally different properties. Totally different properties. Okay? So we're going to talk about some of those modifications. And, and, and the good news, we're not going to have to memorize structures. Right? So no more structures. But you need to be aware of certain modifications as far as naming is concerned, as far as what that word is. No more structures. All right. So one of the very prevalent modifications to a carbohydrate is phosphorylation. They're adding a phosphate, PO4. Right? As a matter of fact, in the tablets, we can see the steam recurring time and again. Right? So you'll see glucose, for example. Now, the other thing is notice here, they're only showing the OH, they're not showing the H. Okay? Because you'll assume immediately that the other atom here is H. So once you know where the OH, you will immediately know where the H is. Okay. So glucose, glucose 6 phosphate, a very famous molecule. One of the first things that happens to glucose when it enters the cell after we eat it is we phosphorate it to prevent it from leaving the cell. Glucose is a very important carbon source, by the way. Uh, here is a, a ketose, here's a tri triose or tri ketose, and that is the hydroxyacetone phosphate. See, it's phosphorylated. It's phosphorylated, the serum hydrogen phosphate. We're going to see all those. Okay? By the way, 2,3-dysphosphoglycerate is a, is, a, is a carboxylic acid of uh, the yeah, uh, soil pack. Okay? So those can be phosphorylated. And mine, by the way, I'm saying you don't have to memorize that. You're going to see that again in the tablets where you're going to have to remember at that time. But you know the soil pack, you just looked about it, and they have excess phosphate as the uh, first two uh, uh, monosaccharides in the elbows and ketones. All right, so notice one, two, three. The third one is phosphorylated, that hence is glycerol high free phosphate. Now, on the other hand, that hydroxyacetyl phosphate, we don't see it saying one or three dihydroxyacetyl phosphate because there's a symmetry that is covered in the middle, so it could be one or three. Okay? So we always say dihydroxyacetyl phosphate. If it's phosphorylated in one, three, then it would be diphosphate. All right, so that's one modification. Phosphorylation is a very important modification to that a lot. Now, ah, the other thing happens after you have monosaccharide and monosaccharide bind together, you end up having a disaccharide. Now, those disaccharides are very important to know. Okay? Those are very famous disaccharides. We use them all the time. All right? So, maltose. Maltose is two glucose monosaccharides attached together. Okay? Now, I said we don't have to know the structure anymore, but I, I actually forgot that those would have to know. Yeah. I apologize. Yeah. Only those, no more. All right, so that's second. So those are two glucoses. Maltose is very actually prevalent uh, sugar in the milk and beer. You know, you can see a lot of that maltose. Yeah, we all want some, maybe you now. But maltose is there. Now let's pay attention to something very important here. The way those are engaged with each other. And this is what I want to focus on. Uh, maltose is two glucoses. But what do you see here? It's actually, in order for it to be maltose, 
It has to be alpha, and everybody is in deep configuration, alpha glucopyranoside, okay, so it's alpha glucose, that's bound through one to four, carbon number one of the first one, carbon number four of the second one, that is also in the alpha configuration. Okay? So you can, can you imagine the nasty trick in the question like this? If any of those change, beta, alpha 1, 6, or whatever, then you don't have maltose. Okay? So it's very important. So maltose is two glucose molecules, both are in alpha, and it's basically, if you will, head to butt, basically. Because one is here, one is here, one to four. Okay? Make sense? That's maltose. Now let's talk about the next very famous uh, disaccharide, and that's super, which is the sugar we eat. All right? That is glucose and fructose. Glucose and fructose. Except here is head to head. The glucose and the fructose are head to head. And so the binding here is, again, alpha glucose, all right, that origin, that is bound to beta fructose. And the bond is between carbon number one and carbon number two. Carbon number one and carbon two. So fructose is actually turning around to face the glucose. And so it's alpha glucose bound through one to two carbons with fructose. And the fructose is in beta configuration. All right, finally, lactose. Lactose is actually a sugar that is prevalent in milk, okay? And that's actually one of the sugars that people have problems if they don't have enough enzymes to destroy it, and hence they have problems with milk, uh, you know, milk and allergies and stuff. And here is two sugars, galactose and glucose. And it's also head to about one to four. One carbon, one to one, and galactose to four, and glucose. Okay? Notice the galactose, it's at the number four. So it is up. All right? But now, now, the bond is between 1 and 4, but it's beta galactose with alpha glucose. If it's alpha galactose with alpha glucose, you don't have the lactose. You have different food. Yeah? So this is one of the really amazing subtleties that carbohydrate can have. Just these configuration of the alpha and beta. All right? So those three sugars, we use them on a daily basis. Really almost, right? Right? Unless you don't drink milk, but the rest we use it on a daily basis. Well, I don't drink beer, so I don't use this. If you have diabetes, then you're not going to use this either. But anyway, you know that. You are aware of it. Okay? On one level or another, you are aware of those disaccharides. Yeah? And they will be part of the metabolism that we are All right, any questions about those disaccharides? Okay. All right, now when you have three and above monosaccharides attached to each other, then you're going to have a polysaccharide. As a matter of fact, sometimes we call oligosaccharides that are between three and, and, and ten or nine, but basically they are all polysaccharides, under the umbrella of poly, more than two saccharides attached to each other. We're going to talk about two famous uh, polysaccharides that we also consume a lot. Uh, the difference. The main categories is basically one is mainly alpha 14 and the other one is beta 14. They're all made of glucose, nothing but glucose. One is alpha glucoses, they're bound to each other with 1416, and I'll have to talk about this a little bit. And the other one is beta glucose. Okay? So let's talk about the simple one cellulose that found in plant. Cellulose is a very good source of fiber. We cannot digest cellulose because we do not have enzymes that break the beta bond between the two glucose molecules. And hence, it's a good fiber source because we cannot digest it. There is no nutritional value as far as calories are concerned because all the glucoses are attached in a strand that is extremely long, infinitely long, of uh, glucose. 1 to 4, 1 to 4, and alpha configuration. Okay, that's a very simple, very practical. Plants have a lot of it. Now, the alpha is what we can digest. We can break any uh, alpha bond between two glucose molecules. We have enzymes that can do that. You'll see that in the in the second part of this class. 
There are two main ones, starch, that usually comes to us from planetary diet, and from animal diet we get glycogen. Okay? The differences are subtle. Okay? Because they are all uh, uh, alpha. Now, in case of glycogen, we have something we call branching. Branching, you will see in the next slide, but basically, you can have, and I'm drawing a very conceptual uh, Okay, so we have those one, I mean four to one, or one to four, one to four, one to four. This is the chain. Now this can be a very long chain, just like cellulose, except it's alpha. The branching happened when we have carbon number six involved in a bond. And so when carbon number six is involved with a bond, then we can have another branch here, and then that branch is hooked up in a uh, alpha one four. But the branching point will be one six. So you can have this kind of structure. Branches of branches, branches of branches, something like that, almost like a tree. Okay? The branch point is always one six. Alpha 1,6. We have enzymes that can break alpha 1,6 as well. Actually, we have a lot of nice assortment of enzymes that can do this. This is why we can get calories and digest those. Now, the difference between both of those is the frequency of branching. How much branches are on one of those? In glycogen, almost every 10 of those alpha 1,4s, you would have a branch. And starch, if we're talking, of course, about amylopectin, and there's two flavors of starch, both of them we like this, amylopectin will have one every 30. So less branches in that plant part of the uh, polysaccharide. Amylose is also just simply what for one for. No tension. Yeah? This is the alpha one for that can go forever. And this is one branching point. From it, you can have also a bone form. Okay? Now, why is it enough if we have enzymes that don't bring those? But what else are the different alpha and beta? Okay? Here's the difference. This is cellulose with beta linkage. Notice that the molecule will go straight all the way, just simply straight, literally straight strands on the other side. The beta, the, the alpha linkage, will actually force to have an angle, <coughs> twist the two molecules. And hence, you will have actually sort of a global kind of globular kind of format when you start to uh, increase. Okay? So actually, there is a difference also structurally between alpha and beta, not just, not just uh, chemical. Okay? So the stuff we can digest, because of the alpha linkage, they tend to be globular. Okay. What other modifications do we have? Now, there's no, of course, structures with no ends. All right. We have two very important kinds of modifications uh, on, on carbohydrates, and that is having either N glycosidic. Now, we know that those bonds are called glycosidic bonds, but those are called N and O glycosidic bonds. That means there is a nitrogen attached to one of the carbons, or instead of one of the carbons, or oxygen attached. Okay? And you go. All right? Now, the structures can be very complex. The R groups, whatever that can, can be many things. Okay? There are many famous sugars that are extremely important in our bodies. We will talk about them conceptually, not structurally. Okay? But we need to be aware of the N glycosidic anomalies. Those kind of modifications of carbohydrates, those kind of modified carbohydrates, actually tend to be added to some of the proteins that need to be modified. Remember? Proteins, after you translate them, we go through something called post-translational modifications, and that's adding stuff to a protein. Those kind of sugars are added to the proteins. Then we talked about glycosylated hemoglobin last time, right? Hemoglobin that's been glycosylated. Okay, same kind of stuff. All right, so N and O. What else? This is an example of N and O glycosylated bond. This is Called, and, and notice the names obviously can be extremely long for a single molecule 
much less, of course, and much more rather for, for the polymers of those. So they tend to polymerize and make complex structures. So this is n acetyl galactose amine. So it's a galactose, you can see it's a of glucose number four, and it has an n acetyl. Okay? So this is for the ability to memorize the structures, I think. Okay? Not even the name, just the old glycosidic and the N-glycosidic. This is beta acetyl uh, glucose amine. Okay, for uh, um, now this is sialic acid. I don't need to know the structure of sialic acid, okay, because it can reach a million through that size. Okay, but I need it to be aware of sialic acid as one of those two sugars. This actually exists in our bodies. We make it, uh, and we think it plays a role in, in cancer cells, proliferating, uh, because uh, they can actually have this around it and the negative charge, they tend to attract more water, they need more water because of that negative charge. All right, they, they, and hence they help with water intake, and they can evade the host immune system. Some infectious agents, bacterial viruses, actually attempt to build salic acid because we have salic acid. And so when they have the salic acid mask, our immune system will not recognize it because people think that this is part of our body, and hence they can invade without the uh, stop our own immune system, and, and that will cause infection. So, uh, bacteria use it for evading. Here's an, uh, one of the examples of evasion of our immune system, the Haemophilus virus. The Haemophilus virus has this mass of sialic acid that will allow it to actually go into our body undetected. Okay, so it's stealthy. And then it has, of course, hemagglutinin and neuraminidase that will allow it to clump and attach to cells and then break the cell wall. Okay, but it uses sialic acid to evade the uh, uh, system. Okay. All right. Cellulose. All right. What is cellulose? Which one of those is cellulose? Let me open it. All right. Go. Now, let's talk about proteins when they are actually together with carbohydrates. Okay? Protein and carbohydrates. So there are three main classes of protein relationship with carbohydrates that actually go beyond just modification. One of them is modification, and we call those glycoproteins. Okay? A lot of our proteins are actually modified by, by glycosylation. Okay? And uh, those usually have proteins mainly, and then they have modification. So that the majority of the weight of that protein, I uh, mean that molecule is a protein and a little bit would be uh, 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 carbohydrates. Those carbohydrates are called, they are the class of black holes and the black hands. That's the name of it. Remember, we're making them more structures. So just need to know black holes and black And they have been actually also to be used in proteoblack hands. That's the second class of proteins and carbohydrates molecules. Except the protein is a smaller percentage of the weight of the molecule. Okay? That's mostly carbohydrate rather than protein. So it's not really a protein being modified by carbohydrate. It's not with it. It's a carbohydrate being modified by protein. So you can imagine how big these polymers are for them to have proteins on them. And you'll see a picture of that. And then we have mucoproteins or mucins. Those are even more of those uh, carbohydrates with some proteins. Now, where those uh, linkages happen between the protein and the amino acid and, and the uh, carbohydrates differ. And mucoproteins is probably three amine and serine. Those two hydroxyl containing amino acids that are bound. Here it will be asparagine and serine. We'll see that in a moment. But those are the three classes of protein with carbohydrates. They are very medically relevant. They are very life relevant. And, uh, they can make our life much easier. We'll see. All right. Here's an example: no memorization structures. Okay? But the modification happened in the glycoprotein on serine or asparagine. Serine sometimes. Okay? But this is the motif. Okay? If you have a sequence, you're going through the primary sequence, and you have asparagine, any amino acid, X means any amino acid, except for protein, of course, uh, serine, and XS, then there is a possibility that you will have glycosylation here. Or if you have NXT for three of these, then there's a possibility you would have that. Does that mean every NXT or S one would have been? No, no, absolutely not. 
As a matter of fact, we still don't know how the body or the cell identified proteins for glycosylation. We think part of it is sequence recognition, but it could be also the 3D structure that or the protein after it falls properly. Blah, blah, blah. It's a very complex process. It's very actually important. We can die without this glycosylation. Okay? So we can just have an appreciation of the complexity in, in, in those life uh, or biological processes. This is just an example here of some modification. As you can see, the modifications can be very elaborate. It's like almost a tree on a single amino acid. All right? And you can see here, this is the uh, you know, abbreviation. Man means mammals, right? Man means mammals, the green. And, and sometimes they wrote as green dots. Uh, let's see here. We have, uh, we have sialic acid for this uh, uh, diamond. Uh, we have galactose. Yeah, again, I'm just uh, showing you the N-acetyl galactose, or glucose, I mean, rather, et cetera, et cetera. So there can be any of those combinations put together. And that's another important thing. So this modification has to be exactly this way for it. So can, can you imagine how many enzymes are working to just put this elaborate thing on top of protein and the right sequence and the right structure in order to have this protein to work, work in the first place? Okay? So we have more than four minutes. It's, it's just, it's just uh, really uh, uh, It's amazing. It's really All right, here's an example of a protein called erythropoietin. That protein, by the way, is a hormone that will uh, increase the production of red blood cells. Yeah. It's actually, unfortunately, been used at one point, maybe still, in some of the endurance sports. You will take it, right? You will take it, and, and, and you will increase your hemoglobin uh, and blood blood cells, and hence you can really go further because you can carry off even better. Okay? So here, this hormone, in order to be functional, it has to be glycosylated, modified. If it's not modified, then it will be only 10% functional. Can you do that? just because of some carbohydrates and some amino acids. And what we think is random, but it's not random. It's not random at all, okay? So you can see that, how that important. Okay, so you can detect it as well with the blood very easily, so people don't use it that much. All right, so over a thousand of our proteins are glycosylated with glucose acetylamine. That's why glycosylation is not only important for that, for functional protein, but it's also good as a nutrient sensing. Okay, we've seen how we can detect it or how we can assess diabetes from non-diabetic just by checking that percentage of glycosylated hemoglobin. But any activity, any active metabolism that's happening with carbohydrate, lipids, proteins, usually means we have a lot of those. So if we have any problem in producing an acetylated glucose I mean, in our body, and, and we do produce in our body as we do with modifications, then we're gonna have problems with a lot of proteins. And hence, it will actually cause a lot of serious, very serious problems. Whether we are overproducing them or underproducing them, same. We have to just produce them right. At the right time, the right medication. Diabetes, cancer, neurological disorders, you name it. It has it all. All kinds of problems can happen because of those molecules, just from a single carbohydrate molecule. Now, here's some examples. This proto-glycan is the second. Uh, class of proteins slash carbohydrates in the reaction. And uh, they also have uh, uh, glycose aminoglycans. So here I'm just mentioning some examples of those glycose aminoglycan molecules. Okay? This hyaluronate is a proteoglycan. That's humongous. And that actually uh, can be used for different things in our bodies. But notice that also bacteria uses it. Staphylococcus. Because we have it, for the same reason Haemophilus uses cell acid, Staphylococcus uses it. Because it can mask itself with this, and it will enter the body, and no white blood cells or antibodies will detect it. Because if it detects it, then it will kill us, right? Because we have a lot of that as well. So that's why they evade the immune system. All right, notice, this is by the way the only uh, glycosamine amino that kind of doesn't have a sulfate on it. You will see in the next slide that the rest of it has sulfate. Not negative But again, no structure memorization. Okay? But this is heroin. Alright? These are the rest of them. Heroin is this one, and those are the rest of them. Do you notice anything familiar for people that use those uh, pills? Okay? For people like me, they're very familiar. Uh, because, you know, we tend to uh, lose those because they are usually in joints 
uh, used as lubricants and, and, and in the knees and stuff like that. So it has CDs. Chondroitin, for example. All right, and keratin. Again, no need to memorize them. But those two, they resist compression. They tend to be compressed, but then they can absorb water and up right back up. They are very good cushion. Okay, of course, not in this form, in the polymer form. They can be humongous. So they're very good. Heparin. Heparin is used in hospitals all the time as an anticoagulant. Right? Right? We don't know why we're producing it, but we think it prevents infection at injury sites as well. Because it's such a big molecule, so it can form a physical uh, barrier against bacteria. We think so. Uh, Dermatan sulfate, another sulfate that goes in your black end. All right? That should go in the skin and heart valves. Also, any problem, you can imagine, you can cause heart diseases. That's because it's not there. So you can see them in joints and, and stuff that flaps open and close, because they're very good there. Okay? Carbohydrates, just from those monosaccharides, add some modification, polymerization, and you have yourself a very complex structure. All right. Here is a trophic black end. All right. Now, this whole thing is a hyaluronan, a hyaluronan, a hyaluronan. And you can see here those little proteins, those G1, G2, these are different blood red proteins just attached to this humongous structure. This is, this is an electromicrograph that's artificial in color. It's mostly, mostly carbohydrates, right? There's some proteins. And you can see here there's keratin, here's chondroitin, uh, here's agritin, you know, there's limits. You know, we can only draw them as cartoons because we cannot draw them as structures. It will take a very long time. Right? Mucoproteins. Those are also humongous carbohydrates with some proteins on them. Okay? Those produce usually in the tachobronchial cell, uh, and the uh, genital cells, uh, and the gastrointestinal cells. They are actually the, the phlegm sometimes, you know, people that have a lot of phlegm. It's a very disgusting molecule, disgusting looking molecule, but it's extremely important. Without it, the liver can die. Okay? Smokers tend to have a lot of those produce because there's irritation, but they overexpress it. But beyond just a regular cold that might uh, allow you to overexpress it, some actual diseases that uh, can really seriously overexpress it and then you have problems. Okay, so they can be used as diagnostic tools, like some carcinomas in the glands and epithelial cells, cystic fibrosis, etc. Those really get to overproduce them. So they are very important. They are extremely important barriers. Now they, they tend to trap chemicals, you inhale. To prevent them from going in and causing further irritation, infection, bacteria can be trapped with it. So if you don't produce them, you really have serious problems. This snotty stuff turned out to be extremely important. And that's really modifications or addition to a threonine or serine on a protein. We have all this stuff. Yeah? So I hope we have a big, big appreciation to carbohydrates as far as personal knowledge. Uh, okay, blood type. Yeah, our blood type is based on carbohydrates. You know, if you take the wrong blood, what happens? You die. All right? We have three antigens. We have O, we have A, and we have B. Okay? We have a combination of those. All right? Now, look at this. And this is the cartoon diagram of the same thing. Now, A, this main branch, they all have the same main branch, but A has an acetyl galactose in it. B has just galactose without the acetyl. That makes a big difference. Just having the acetyl modification would you. O has neither. And guess why is that? All right? For galactosamine, we have an enzyme called glycosyl transferase A. Then most of them are called glycosyl transferase. But this particular enzyme exists in the people that have the A antigen. The people that have B, they have get uh, glycosyl transferase B. The people that have O, and that's why, of course, there would be that cross-reaction to get the whole blood back. Yeah? O, a mutation that produces neither one of those enzymes. And that's why O can give to all of those, because there's no problem. Okay? So mutation in those two enzymes will actually prevent you from having any modification would be developed. Okay? Otherwise, we have either. Or we have both. Maybe. Then, carbohydrate. Carbohydrates do that. Um, so where does this process happen? This protein modification, where does it happen? Especially for lack of proteins. 
they happen in two organelles. I'm going to, of course, rely a little bit on your uh, hopefully knowledge of uh, cell biology. We have, of course, Golgi apparatus and we have endoplasmic reticulum, right? We have both of those organelles inside the cell. Those are basically organelles with many folded membranes, very elaborate folded membranes. Golgi apparatus usually buds out of endoplasmic reticulum and then it can be converted to different vesicles. One of them, of course, it can fuse to the outside, to the cell membrane, secreting stuff outside. Okay? As a matter of fact, it turned out that those carbohydrates can serve as an address on that protein. That will tell you if that protein is to stay inside the cell, doing something inside, or getting secreted outside. But there are other signals of carbohydrates are one of them. Yes? Sort of like an address in the middle. So, the modification happened on these, inside these two organelles. Uh, the plasma uh, and the in particular. Hydrogen protein and glycosylation happen inside the endoplasmic reticulum. They are. Then proteins run out and they go to the Golgi apparatus. There, they end up having oral glycosylation if any oral glycosylation is needed. If there's any further modification, it really happens inside the Golgi apparatus. All right? And then they elaborate it more and then they will go to their destination. And that destination can be, again, staying inside the cell or going outside. So who carries those modifications? What is the tray, if you will, that carries this? So there's a tray, a fatty molecule, called doricophosphate. You do not need to memorize the structure of doricophosphate. You need to know doricophosphate. This is a tray that is a fatty tray that basically is floating in the membrane. And right there at the phosphate end of that tray, you can add these different branches. All right, it carries it, already brand made, then the enzyme that takes this branch and stick it on a protein. That enzyme has very nice work. Dolical phosphate. So can you imagine, of course, what happens if we don't have dolical phosphate? No black oscillation. We die. All right. I'm just trying to be uh, less subtle. All right. So, was the, 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 the stuff that really made this, of course, again, the sequence of the protein, its 3D structure, and other factors that we're probably not even aware of. Yet. Okay. Now, the assembly machinery, there are enzymes called, the, the, those enzymes you call them, all those enzymes that do this transferring, this breaking, we call them glycosyl transferases. And as you would imagine, there are thousands and thousands of these enzymes with thousands and thousands of species. Without them, and they all are in our genes, right? They're all special our genes that we need them. They come the right time, produce the right modification, and that's attached to the right protein at the right time. Okay? And then just to have some sort of a back. Oh, all right. Oh, black oscillation. Where does that take place? All right, so again, that's where uh, the, the, the uh, modification takes place. And again, those proteins can be anywhere here. They can be in a free lysosome that fill up as a lysosome. Uh, they can be in a secretary granule that go out. Lysosome, of course, if they were to be recycled, for example, they end up in the lysosome, and then there will be enzymes that will be recycling. Recycling is a very important part of our life, by the way, because we don't have always, well, you know, animals, we, we, in this, uh, of course, we have our plenty of food, so we don't have that problem, but usually uh, our bodies do recycle those amino acids, uh, those carbohydrates, because, you know, we want to reuse them as much as possible. All right, so how serious is this? Very serious. Of course, we've already seen how serious it is, but let me tell you about two uh, ailments that happen because of this. One is called the eye cell disease. So as I just mentioned, the normal path is recycled proteins end up in lysosome, processing enzymes will come and separate the carbohydrates from the protein. Carbohydrates are broken into monosaccharides and their units, and that's recycled. And of course, proteins are broken into amino acids, and that's recycled, as we will see that towards that third part of our course. And the ISO path, I stand for inclusion bodies. Proteins end up in the lysosome. But then, they just get stuck there. 
No processing takes place. The enzyme that crushes them, and here I'm very dramatic, the processing enzyme is missing. It never showed up to work. And hence what happened, you end up having those lysosome inclusion bodies that have those unprocessed proteins and unprocessed carbohydrates. That can really accumulate, and that can eventually cause death with, of course, many disorders. Okay? Why that enzyme didn't show in there? You will not believe that, because it's not glycosylated properly. It has a mannose, but it should be mannose 6-phosphate. So not only it's glycosylated, but it wasn't properly added. The phosphate wasn't added. That enzyme, instead of being sent to, re to the lysosome, it was addressed to the outside, and it was secreted. It's a wrong address. If somebody had the wrong address, that enzyme they ended up kicking it out of the cell. As a matter of fact, one of the of this disease is to detect that enzyme in the blood and urine. It was secreted out there. The enzyme wasn't addressed properly because it wasn't glycosylated properly. Okay? Simple mistake. This is another disease, herbal disease. Same thing. Same thing. Very good girl. Uh, really, and, and, and what the poor thing, what happens here in this disease is that those accumulation of unprocessed tumors end up under the skin and they end up having the disorders and they end up that pretty good thing. Okay? Again, improper black oscillation. Okay? The wrong carbohydrate. So it's amazing. We thought in our life, previous life, a couple of lectures ago, that proteins being folded the right way is the most important thing, and that's it. But actually, black oscillating those proteins with a proper carbohydrate is actually very important. Okay, are we cool so far? Any questions? All right, I'm just gonna touch, just tell you what we're gonna talk about next time. That's lipids, our last macromolecule. Lipids are very cool, check it All right, are lipids important? They are very important. As a matter of fact, lipids, they form, remember that long structure, right? They are long, they hate water, and they tend to aggregate together. And it's this hydrophobic effect, this non covalent assemblies that make membranes that allow our cells to exist in the first place. That's our first compartment in life, is this hydrophobic assemblies to make these little compartments. And then inside those little compartments, life happens and flourishes with those different enzymes. Without this bag that we call cell, without those uh, non covalent weak bonds assemblies of uh, fatty acids, you will never have a cell membrane. You'll never have cell. You will never exist. Okay? So fatty acids are important. Fat is extremely important. All right? Now, <coughs> we're going to cover uh, different aspects of uh, fatty acids, but of course, obviously, they are one of the most prevalent molecules in our world. Because every cell has a membrane, and every membrane is made of fatty acids. So there, at the very least, we have a lot of those. Okay? Then we have the different kinds of fatty acids, different kinds of lipid molecules, like cholesterol, etc., etc. But the membrane itself, of course, is one of the most things that we see. Okay, hydrophobic qualities, as we talked about in the, in the first lecture, where you end up with this uh, hydrophobic assembly. All right? Now, chemically, and I'm sure you are aware of that because of organic chemistry, uh, there is way to name it. Okay? Right. Here we have red boxes of stuff I want you to memorize, but I really don't want you to memorize structure because the structure of fatty acids, let's face it, is very simple. You just keep drawing CH2, 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 and then you reach the right number. All right? What I want you to know here is not the drawing of the fatty acid, because you know that, is how we deal with what we call double bonds or unsaturations. And then, of course, how also we deal with the number of carbons. Those are actually very important factors in, in life. Okay? Unsaturation, or saturation, the opposite of unsaturation. Unsaturation means there's double bonds between those carbons. Unsaturation, that means a single bond all the way. All the way. And uh, how do we name it? How do we name it? Because we are going to talk about, obviously, beta oxidation for fatty acids, and we are going to deal with some unsaturation there. So here are some of the famous uh, lipids that have absolutely no uh, unsaturation. They're all single bonds, 12, 14, 16, 18, and 20, and those exist in our daily life. Okay? Uh, laureate, or lauric acid, uh, meristate, palmitate, stearate, uh, arachnidine. Okay? Those are some of the things. Okay? Polyhead, olive oil, 
presents with you. Okay, now let's go to this box here. I'm showing three examples that I want you to be aware of. 16 and 18, actually two flavors of the 18 carbon fatty acid. And that's foliate and linoleate. Now let's go here to this part, okay? To this color right here, this color. Let's look at the name. You see that we have this symbol. First of all, they're all cis. Cis, this is something in organic chemistry where the two hydrogens are actually facing the same thing rather than opposite each other, right? Trans or cis. I'm hoping you know that. Or you remember that. that if you don't, then you know. You can talk about it later. But cis. All right. Now, the, the symbol delta, the triangle, means there's unsaturation. There's a double bond. That's what delta means. Double bond. There's a double bond. Now, the number on top of that delta tells you what carbon the delta starts from. So, if you go here to the uh, to the 16 carbon, the palmito EA, you will see that it's delta 9. That means the double bond is between carbon number 9 and 10. So you can draw your 16 carbon, starting with a carboxylic acid, all the way, and then when you reach 9 and 10, you just take hydrogen out of either one and add from both of them, and you put that double bond. Okay? That's one unsaturation. It's very important we need unsaturated, by the way. We can only unsaturate, we'll see that later, and I'm going on tangent here for now. Uh, we can only unsaturate a certain number of carbons in, in our body. The rest we have to take from body, from, from food. And if you don't take it, also we have problems. Okay? Because that's all essential that is. All right. Only it, delta 9, except it's 18. Then only it, it's two unsaturation. One is delta 9, between 9 and 10, and the other one, delta 12, between 12 and 13. Okay? So there are two on separation of that one. The other one, the, the, the originator of that thing is a stearate. A stearate acid. Okay? So really, in fatty acids, the good news about fatty acids, that really there's not much structure to know. Alright? Metabolically, we'll talk about that. You just have to break it. Even metabolically, they're very easy to know. They're quite, quite actually fun. You will see, you will be pleasantly surprised when we talk about their oxidation, because it's really a very redundant process. Two carbon at a time, two carbon at a time, we don't stop. And so this is one of the fatty acids. Now, obviously, fatty acids can be used for many other things other than just simply membranes, right? right? They are very important fuel, and so they store energy. Okay? I mean, one look at me, you know that I'm storing a lot of fat. Okay? That is fat. That's very important. That is a very important thing. Why? Because fat is a permanent energy store, it's a very efficient energy store. Now it can be too efficient, that's not good, but it's a very good energy store. And we'll talk about the advantage of having fat as a fat store. And what body does do that. And we talk about nutrition. Uh, signal transduction. Very important. Without it, there is no communication between different cells and tissues in the body. And that is actually very problematic. So many diseases caused on the fact that those signal molecules are not there. Part of the memory. We will be talking about three main fatty acids in our bodies. Phospholipids, glycolipids, and cholesterol. Phospholipids are lipids with phosphate. Here, we're talking about modifications. Glycolipids, here are the carbohydrates again. There are modifications of lipids with carbohydrates. Very important molecules. And then cholesterol, that we get to steroids from. Those are the main branches of fatty acids that we will be about. And this is just uh, basically a little piece of what we can talk about. This is a phospholipid part of the membrane. And we talked about that at the very beginning. We are going to talk about it in the future. All right. That's adjourned. Thank you very much. Don't forget your quiz. <laughs>